Hi, this is Dr. Mayberry. Uh, we are just going to finish up this lecture on the forces of evolution and formation of species uh, following up on class that ended on Wednesday. So this is just the material in this PowerPoint that we didn't get to on Wednesday. So we stopped right here at selection and fitness. So this is where we'll start. So we were talking about natural selection and we were talking about selective forces or agents and the selective agent in an environment uh, is the thing that is keeping an organism from reproducing because reproduction is the important part about natural selection it's not enough to just survive you have to reproduce so fitness is a person or an organism's reproductive success during their lifetime so if you've reproduced a lot of babies, uh, then you have a high fitness level. And we've mentioned this briefly before. Now, the idea behind producing offspring is to get your DNA into the next generation. But personally, reproducing is actually not the only way to get your DNA into the next generation because your siblings share your DNA. So if enough of your siblings have enough offspring, then they will pass on essentially statistically enough DNA that you share that you are actually okay in terms of fitness. So for yourself, if you have offspring, you really need two offspring in the next generation to maintain the same amount of DNA that you have in the present generation. So if your sibling already shares 50% of your DNA, then they will pass on half of that DNA to their offspring. So any one of their offsprings, offspring will have a quarter of your DNA. So if you have at least four nieces and nephews, then that compensates if you have no offspring. Okay, so this is the idea, and it's, it's not just an idea, it's, it's true, that family shares your DNA, and that is evolutionarily advantageous. And so that's where we're sort of starting here. This idea that biologically enough of your genetic material is shared with your kin, your relations, that that matters evolutionarily. And so these two concepts of group selection and kin selection are based on that. So the idea behind group selection was actually a little looser. It just said that if you live in a social group, you are likely to protect the individuals in that group. Whether you're related to them or not is the group selection concept. And the thing that makes that not particularly accurate is that just because you're living in a group socially with other organisms that are probably of the same species as you doesn't mean that sacrificing yourself for them is a benefit. If you're not related to them, it's not actually evolutionarily a benefit to you. However, if you protect your kin, your relatives with your life, that can potentially be evolutionarily advantageous. So protecting the individuals that share your genes is good enough in terms of evolution. So if I gave up my life to save four of my nieces and nephews evolutionarily, that would be totally reasonable. So this, this um, sort of gets into the realm of evolutionary psychology, uh, which has, you know, a lot of benefits and a lot of drawbacks in terms of studying biology and evolution. But the idea is that I wouldn't consciously think, oh, four of my nieces and nephews are at risk. I can sacrifice my life for them. It's, it's a biological imperative to do so. So I would instinctually do this uh, because my, my body, I guess, knows that that would be an advantage in terms of evolution and survival of my DNA. So they've actually run tests and people, animals are more likely to sacrifice their own lives for individuals that they're related to sometimes even if they don't actually know that they're related to the person, uh, they're still more likely to put themselves at risk. So 
for this to really work uh, and, and be evolutionarily advantageous for my life to be sacrificed, uh, I keep saying four of my nieces and nephews, if I sacrificed my life for three of my nieces and nephews, that actually wouldn't keep my same level of DNA in the population. So that would not be evolutionarily advantageous. At four or more for nieces and nephews, it would be. For children, if I sacrifice my life for two of my own children, that is acceptable. If it's for one, then that's actually not advantageous for my DNA. Now, would I do that as, as a mother? Yes, right? It's not saying don't sacrifice your life for your children if necessary. Uh, it's just saying that biologically and evolutionarily, it can be an advantage. So I actually have this picture of meerkats uh, up on this slide because I've watched all of one episode of Meerkat Manor in my life. Uh, and in that episode, one of the meerkats sacrificed their life. They protected a younger sibling from a snake attack. And they were bitten by like a rattler snake and they were killed. But they were willing, that little meerkat uh, was willing to sacrifice his life for a sibling. And that evolutionarily was actually not a ridiculous thing to do. Uh, so kin selection is very real, uh, and, you know, you aren't, again, you're not balancing deliberately. Oh, four, four nieces and nephews is good, but three isn't. It's this willingness, this instinct uh, in your own body to be willing to put your life at risk for organisms that share your genetics. So it is a very real thing. Okay. So we've been talking about evolution. We talked about the four mechanisms of evolution, and we'll actually have a lab on the four mechanisms next week. Uh, but realize that for evolution to happen, we need some things. We need variation, right? And we get variation by mutations, which is one of the mechanisms of evolution, by meiosis, so cell division creating haploid gametes, right, with only one copy, half of the DNA necessary for a viable organism, and then sexual reproduction, which is fertilization of an egg and a sperm, right? That half of that DNA is coming from a father and half is coming from a mother. That's creating enough variation uh, that evolution happens uh, based on genetic drift and gene flow and natural selection and, and all of that. Uh, so natural selection, remember, is not random. Uh, it's, it's adaptations and favored variants in a specific environment. Random chance, that is gene flow and genetic drift, and that also, and mutation for that matter, and that also can change allele frequencies. So just to be aware of, of these things that are all necessary for evolution. All right, so how do we actually study evolution? Allele frequencies are the way that we can actually look at evolution. And we did some of this math on the board the other day, uh, along with this lecture that, that's from the original PowerPoint. I've created a smaller second little PowerPoint that goes along with an activity that you have to do uh, that looks at allele frequencies. So I will know that you know how to calculate allele frequencies, because this is how we can measure evolution. It's this change in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. Another way that we can look at this, I already showed you this formula once, uh, is the Hardy-Weinberg equation. So this is theoretical. It's, it's used in a lot of simulations, but we also can use it uh, to look at real populations. And the way it works is this equation should always equal 1. P is the frequency of usually the dominant allele. Q is the frequency of usually the recessive allele, but it doesn't really matter. And so the formula says P squared, which is basically homozygous dominant, uh, plus 2PQ, these are heterozygous, times 2, plus Q squared, which is basically homozygous recessive, should equal 1. So the frequencies plugged in where these letters are should equal 1. If it doesn't equal 1, then we know that evolution is happening. Okay, so along with this, uh, I just explained all of this to you, P plus Q should equal 1 because allele frequencies in a population, if you have the frequency of the dominant allele and the frequency of the recessive allele and you add them together, that should equal 1. So this is the equation itself. And then these are the assumptions associated with the equation. So if it were 
one, then evolution would not be happening. Okay, so it's really, it's never one, but that's why this is theoretical and it's used in simulations. So the equation assumes an infinite population size. Well, that's literally impossible. There's never an infinite population size, right? But when you're using it in a simulation, that's, that's okay. It assumes random mating. And this is one of the reasons that I actually talk about Hardy-Weinberg, even though I don't actually make you do it. Um, there is no such thing as random mating, really, right? Uh, and this sort of goes along with the kin selection idea. Instinctually, you protect your kin. Well, there are subconscious things that any organism looks for in a mate. So you're, you're choosing your mate. You're being very particular about your mate, even if you're not thinking about it uh, actively. So the idea of random mating in general is actually just, it's not a thing. But there are many genes and many alleles that you do mate randomly for, right? There are things like blood type. Do you take blood type into account when you're choosing a mate? Probably not. There are a lot of other things that you've never even, you didn't even know there were genes for that we do mate randomly for. So depending on the gene, there actually can be random mating. So with Hardy-Weinberg, you're looking specifically at one gene, uh, and there can actually be random mating for that gene. Uh, you also assume with Hardy-Weinberg that there's no selection that's happening. There's no advantage to one allele or another. We assume that there are no new mutations, right? If we have a P allele and a Q allele, and then all at once another allele pops in there, that, that the equation will no longer work. Uh, and we also assume there's no gene flow. So even though the population size has to be infinite, there can't be any movement of alleles from one population to another. So these are not all, un these are not all realistic. Uh, but they are very useful for us to be able to sort of look at these assumptions and say, okay, well, there actually, there is random mating for this gene. There is no selection and no new mutations and there's no gene flow, but maybe this other assumption isn't, you know, held true. So this is a really useful thing. If you take a population genetics class, you learn this over and over and over and you learn how to use it in a bunch of different ways. I think it's important to introduce you to uh, so that you can understand it, but I'm not going to make you do the math ever. Uh, so you will be doing math for allele frequencies, but not for Hardy-Weinberg. But this is one way that we test whether evolution is happening, and it's a very important tool, so you do need to know um, what it is and sort of how it works. Okay, so we're going to stop there uh, for the first component of this lecture, so you need to move into uh, the second uh, video for this lecture.